Hey everyone, welcome to Operations, the show where we look under the hood of companies in hypergrowth. My name is Sean Lane. We've all at some point heard about or felt some flavor of imposter syndrome. That feeling where you're quite certain that you don't belong and you're moments away from everyone figuring out that you're a complete fraud. When I was first starting out in my career, I assumed that those feelings of imposter syndrome were reserved for the up and comers. But looking back, with the benefit of more than a decade in SaaS and nearly 100 episodes of this show, I know that that assumption was foolish. I don't care if you're an intern or there's a C in front of your title, there's still some element of that self doubt. And after talking with today's guest, I'm more convinced than ever that that hint of doubt. That nagging imposter syndrome is a really good thing. Our guest today is Ping Del Giaduce, Vice President of Revenue Operations at Leapsum. Ping was recently named to the top 100 revenue operations leaders of 2022, and still, even she has her own version of imposter syndrome. When I interviewed Ping, she was a little more than a year into her role as the VP of Global RevOps at AppViewX. And I wanted to learn from her how she approaches joining a brand new company as an operator. In our conversation, we talk about losing all of your institutional knowledge when you leave your job. We talked about the inherit versus build decisions you have to make on a new team and the major project she found herself signing up for on just her second day on the job. Let's start, though, with her entry into a new business. What does that feel like coming in with a blank slate? It's almost like when you finish elementary school, you would be, you know, fifth grade, the oldest in the whole school. (laughs) Then you go to middle school where it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm starting from all over. (laughs) But then, you know, you've kind of built that experience as well. That definitely should not discount that at all. Um, I know it sounds cliche. We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Hmm. Right? definitely (laughs) always listening and learning first. Well, you may have the experience under your belt where you've worked for, like myself, 15 years in the field. You don't know the company, right? It's the people there who know the company. Um, it's listening and learning for sure. Um, but then speak up when mm. you see red flags, for example, or you think that, hey, you're, you could provide value. Um, but, you know, a big part of me can't help but feel like, do I really know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, I've been done this for a long time, but what if it's not the case here in this company? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I think that's a healthy way to think about it, though. And so on, on your way in the door, you know, at now looking back, having a year under your belt, how much of it was, okay, this is what I can draw on from my breadth of experience versus, oh, this is a very unique set of problems that are unique to this company. That's a good question. Um, But I think because of the nature of my role, right, it's revenue operations. And luckily for me, the the type of the company isn't as important when it comes to the product, uh, assuming it's SaaS business, which luckily I have been in the SaaS business. Um, Like the model and how you think about how processes and systems and all that fun stuff should be set up. You can apply it company to company, uh, again, assuming it's SaaS business. But knowing myself, I, I don't want to come in and kind of show people, hey, this is what I know. This is what you should do. Again, situations could be different, right? Um, I did come in, you know, inheriting a relatively big team, the, the biggest team I've ever had, team of 10. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, do I deserve to have 10 people in my belt? Can I really provide value? <laughs> um, definitely spending a lot of time with them, right? They've done this for a long time. One team member has been here 10 years. That experience, that institution knowledge, you can't, I don't know, you can't really learn that from a textbook, so to speak. I think it's pretty (laughs) admirable and and, and also very telling about you as a person that even with your experience and coming in as a vice president, like you still have a little bit of that (laughs) imposter syndrome as you're coming in. And obviously you are very qualified for the job you have, otherwise you wouldn't have got it, right? But like. How do you, like, is that how you actually felt when you were first starting? And, and how do you deal with that in a way that is both to your point, like uh, approach from a perspective of listening, but also, you know, you now have to lead these 10 people. 
<laughs> I, I did feel that way uh, a lot of the times. I won't lie. You know, mm. people listening to it now, hey, I did. Um, <laughs> I remember day two. Day two, it was a Tuesday. I sat on Monday. Um, I synced up with the VP of marketing where, you know, they were in the middle of launching the lead object into Salesforce. Um, I, she walked me through a quick, dirty rundown and said, hey, we're going to launch next week. <laughs> and I was very nervous. And I said, I know it's day two for me, but um, I don't think you're ready. <laughs> I don't think we're ready. <laughs> by that by that time, I was part of the team, so I don't, I don't think we're ready for it. So she, she was, I think, somewhat relieved. And when okay, do you want to own this object, uh, this project? To which I went, uh, you know, day two, you kind of don't want to say no too quickly. Mm. <laughs> I said, sure, okay, we did launch it. It was um, two months later we launched it. Definitely had huge help from my team. Couldn't have done it myself. I'm sure you're getting the same sense that I am, but it's pretty clear the type of humble servant leader that Ping is. Even with extended experience and an impressive title, she's still out to prove herself and she doesn't take anything for granted. She knows that there are some foundational SaaS elements that are transferable based on her experience, but she still feels real imposter syndrome when she takes on a new role. But ultimately, she dives right in. She even caught herself and said we when referring to her brand new team on day two. How can you not want to work with someone like that? I also think that the reaction she got from her marketing partner is more common and revealing than you might think. We all might be a little hesitant to speak up or offer an alternative when we're first starting in a new role, but that marketing leader, to their credit, didn't recoil at Ping's suggestion or ask, what do you know? She was relieved and immediately was like, please take this off my plate. And that's true whenever you start a new job. You're going to inherit what's already there. Teams, systems, baggage. And so I was curious how Ping evaluated what she was inheriting versus what she needed to build on her own. Definitely getting feedback from the team, right? I mean, ultimately, I'm not building this for myself. You know, I'm not the ultimate users of these tools or the processes. Um, I, I remember putting time on, you know, AEs and CSMs and the various leaders' calendars. Basically, in advance, asking them to prepare two questions to answer, what's working well and what can should be better. Because I, I really shouldn't just build something if there's no need, right? Kind of like sales 101, you don't show up and throw up. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if it's working well, why change the process? Mm. Unless, you know, you think you can, you know, you can build it better and make it more efficient, then yeah, makes sense. Um, but I, I think the more focus would be if you talk to 10 people, eight, if not 10 of them are saying, hey, you know, this thing is really annoying. We have to put it in three different places or we have to click 10 things if I can do a submit a quote, whatever it might be, right? Then that should be somewhat of a red flag. Maybe you should focus on that first. So that might be the replace if it's something to replace. Um, but if it's working well, let's just keep it at least for the time being. Mm. Because as you come into a new job, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> Any new job, there's so much to learn. Like, and you know, usually a role opens up because there's also so much to do. Definitely have to prioritize. Prioritize. And as you were kind of taking that in, like, what did you learn? Like, what did you learn about what was working well or what you know could should be better? Yeah, sometimes it goes back to the basic. I think you know, if you ask. Five different people, 10 different people, you know, let's say what the numbers are for MQL for Q1, and you get five different answers, there might be a fundamental problem. Mm. Maybe there's no consistent definition, which was actually what I found when I first started. Somebody was calling MQL something else versus SQL versus SQO. So the very basic, let's put a playbook of de definitions. Mm. This is what we're calling MQL. This is what we're calling SQL and SQO. And then not just do it and not share it. Definitely share it with the team. Get feedback and then share it ultimately. I feel like there's, there's almost an art in and of itself to kind of having those types of interview style conversations and how you react to that information, right? Because, you know, in, on one end of the spectrum, you could hear those five, 10 different definitions and be like, 
what are you guys doing? Like you, you have no, like every single one of you has a different answer for this count, but like, that's not a helpful or constructive way to react. And so what's on the other end of that spectrum? Like, how did you work your way through those interviews in a way that kind of one set you up to fix them, but two, you know, also kind of set up these very early foundational relationships that you were going to need to be successful in this role? Yeah, there's no ego. I think that's huge, right? Be humble in your approach. I'm here to help. I'm not here to take away anyone's job. I mean, unless they want me to in that project <laughs> that was passed on very sure. quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely being humble about it and have them somewhat see you as an ally, right? Let's work together. If there are silos, how do we remove the silos? And you know, if it makes sense to do a regular cadence, like a weekly one-on-one, let's put that on the calendar. Um, you know, if I'm not clear about something, yeah, please, please always ask questions. If I'm not clear about something, you know, I might apologize and say, this might sound stupid, but hey, I have my questions. Have them see you as an ally. Ping took the time as she started her role to interview frontline teammates, really listen and observe what to what their day-to-day was like. And the beauty of having a fresh set of eyes is you can really bring objectivity to your new role and your new company, which, by the way, benefits the company. I think the other thing that's important to hear is to approach these situations, giving the benefit of the doubt to those who have come before you. Chances are those people are pretty smart. And at the time they made the decisions they made, they had a reason for why they made them. That doesn't mean the reason is still valid, but you might not have the context for what was true at the time. And those interviews Ping conducted are critical to filling in what that historical context might have been. But I also imagine the lists of problems she emerged with from those interviews were pretty long. So what did she do next with her lists? I won't lie, I was overwhelmed. (laughs) Within my first month, I remember reaching out to my manager and said, I, I don't know where to start. There's so much to do. I mean, you did tell me there's a lot to work on. This is a lot to work on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I was appreciative for sure where he said, you know, Ping, take a step back. You know, it's a big elephant. One bite at a time. <laughs> I know it's a bad metaphor. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. And, you know, ultimately, to tackle it because you're new, you know, you have your, to pr- prove yourself somewhat, right? So the low hanging fruit, I feel like is really important. Um, my example, I did have three people in the team where they're, they're fantastic. But what I learned what they were doing was basically um, data entry to a certain extent, you know, doing things that we have tools, we have purchase tools to do. Um, so I spoke with each of them and kind of figured out, you know, what is your goal? You know, what you do is important, but ultimately, I don't imagine this is what you want to do long term. I mean, if it is, that's okay. Tell me too. That's totally fine. Um, I feel like that's relatively low hanging fruit, fruit, fruit from my perspective. It was relatively easy to do. Um, and also the bigger picture, the company's North Star or what I see true RevOps North Star, it's always ARR, mm. repeatable ARR. What mm. can I do now that would have the greatest impact on ARR? Like if, if I have to rank it, so it's the low hanging fruit. And then the greatest impact on ARR. And then to what I was saying early on, you know, based on the feedback that you receive from the team and what's working, what could be better. If you hear the same feedback from almost 100% of the team member where this is really annoying, this really sucks, maybe that should be higher on the priority list. Um, yeah, and because I did inherit a relatively big team, you know, after learning what as much as I could in the short time, what each of the team members' strengths were, keep empowering them, right? I'm here to help. I'm not here to hinder your job. You've been here for a long time. You've been doing a great job. Keep going, mm. right? The empowerment, I, I feel strongly about that for sure. Keep them going. And so I, I, within that, like I'm hearing some people-related things. I'm hearing some process-related things. Like um, as you were assessing it sounded like there was uh, some level of um, like impact versus effort almost in, in, in terms of the way that you were, you were going about the prioritization process. Like 
Is that something that you're doing yourself or to your point of empowerment, like how much of that are you thinking about, okay, how can I learn fast, but also empower the 10 people on my team to help me with all this low hanging fruit? Yeah, I would say it's both. Um, you know, whatever project that they have been working on, let's not stop it. Assuming you know, it's for good reasons and they almost all were. Mm. Um, keep going. Definitely keep going. And from my perspective, like putting down my list, which includes my team's list. And then I think something that may sometimes get overlooked is the communication part, right? Yes, I want to align with my team. Yes, I want to align with my manager. But RevOps is very much cross-functional. I need to align with the different departments as well, right? If I have a plan to do something and if it affects them, I need to make sure that they know about it and hopefully agree. <laughs> Can, can you tell me a little bit more about what that communication looked like or, or how what you kind of learned in, in terms of making sure that all of those different cross-functional partners knew about your assessment and kind of the early things that you thought were going to be the most important? Yeah, I'm a very much a note taker. I like to make lists um, almost everywhere. I have lots of lists. You know, here's the list I need to talk to my manager about. Um, I remember putting together a presentation for RevOps, kind of a first 90-day plan, and then plan for the first half of the year, second half of the year, and so on and so forth. Um, I started with the first 90-day plan, making sure that my manager and I were aligned, and then I shared it with the team. Mm. So, you know, they can access it almost anytime they wanted to. I did break the 90 day down to first 30 days to tackle the low-hanging fruit, because <laughs> the first 30 day was a lot about the learning, but then, again, being new, I... I wanted to show that, hey, I'm here, I can make an impact. I'm here and I can make an impact. I feel like I should write that on a sticky note and stick it on the monitor of my desk. That's really what all operators want, to make an impact. So if you're starting a new gig, I'd follow the order that Ping is preaching for prioritizing what you tackle first. One, find the low-hanging fruit. Two, find what will have the biggest impact to ARR. And three, follow the areas where you hear the most consistent feedback about what sucks. And lastly, communicate early and often with your cross-functional partners about what you're finding and what you're prioritizing. Ping, of course, used this communication as an opportunity to fill in her own blind spots. And I can't help but think that her version of imposter syndrome, her humility, are key ingredients to what make her such a successful operator. Before we go, at the end of each show, we're going to ask each guest the same lightning round of questions. Ready? Here we go. Best book you've read in the last six months? Best book I've read in the last six months. I wish you had given me time to prepare, Sean. That's okay. That's why we do it on the spot. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, I want to say that, I mean, I have a 12 year old daughter. Um, you know, being in the tween, it's. I wasn't exactly a great twin myself. So sometimes <laughs> it's like payback time. And it's also a very different er uh, time, right? Very different time. Um, I recently read this book called Reviving Ophelia. I mean, yeah. I don't know how applicable this might be to a lot of people. Doesn't have to be a business book. <laughs> um, you know, definitely opened up my eyes where I, I didn't grow up with all that much technology right now. You know, she has a phone. The internet is. Mm. right at her fingertip some helpful tips there cool <laughs> all right uh favorite part about working in ops i get to remain neutral mm. <laughs> it's so important to be neutral um you know it's not sales versus cs or product versus technical uh, uh, sales i would say it's we all work together this i get to be neutral i like that <laughs> All right. So flip side, least favorite part about working in ops. A lot of people see ops as back end, mm. which is not exactly wrong, but I don't see that as the main part of ops, right? They kind of, I see the main part of my role, at least it's, it's a strategy part. I get to use my brain. <laughs> I like doing that. Um, when people assume you, you are back end, you're support, you're admin, I don't quite like that. Yeah. Someone who impacted you getting to the job you have today? 
Um, I would definitely say the CRO. Yeah, he did bring me on board. He um, he is somebody who lets me run. Trust that I will go to him with with issue if there are issues. Um, he was one who said it's a big elephant. Take one chunk <laughs> at a time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Awesome. All right, last one. One piece of advice for people who want to have your job someday. Ooh, um, ask questions. You have a lot of customers. Your customers are the sales reps, the sales managers, the CSMs, the CS managers, marketing, product, the leadership team. Make sure you ask questions. Don't assume things. Thanks so much to Ping for joining us on this week's episode of Operations. If you liked what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to our show so you can get a new episode in your feed every other Friday. Also, if you learned something from Ping today or from any of our episodes, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, six star reviews only. All right, that's gonna do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.